Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. I am delighted to introduce to you Rohit Chopra, Director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. As you may know, the CFPB is a unit of the Federal Reserve charged with protecting families and honest businesses from illegal practices by financial institutions and with ensuring that markets for consumer financial products and services are fair, transparent, and competitive. As director of the Bureau, Chopra is also a member of the board of directors of the FDIC and the Financial Stability Oversight Council, both of which have kept him a little busy lately, and so he's been unable to travel to Irvine. Director Chopra has had an illustrious career before him, so I will only give you a couple of highlights as introduction. And I'll selfishly start with the time when we worked together at the CFPB while he served as his first student loan ombuds between 2010 and 2015. He also served as a commissioner on the Federal Trade Commission, where he successfully worked to strengthen sanctions against repeat offenders and to reverse the agency's reliance on no money, no fault settlements in fraud cases. We're very happy to have him join us at UCI to talk about the Bureau's work ensuring fair dealing in financial markets. One small logistical point, please feel free to submit questions during using the Q&A button, and we will get to as many as we can after his remarks. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Director Chopra. Well, thank you for that introduction and thanks for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm really grateful to you, Professor Jimenez, for all that you've done, not just uh, with us at the CFPB years ago, but all the work you've done with your students and scholarship. Um, it has had a lot of impact and it is something we closely follow. As you mentioned, given the events over the last few weeks involving Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and Credit Suisse, I apologize that I'm unable to be with you there in person. The recent bank failures have certainly raised questions about the fragility and safety of our financial system. U.S. regulators have taken a number of extraordinary measures to protect depositors and restore confidence. We continue to carefully monitor the situation and evaluate how to adjust existing regulation and supervision of these very large financial institutions. We've seen before how inadequate oversight of financial firms can lead to devastating results. While I'm not there in person, I think we know about Orange County, California. It was the home of many major subprime mortgage outfits, some even headquartered right in Irvine. Many of them are now defunct, but the financial pain caused by the failures of regulation are still felt today. And this brings me to the focus of my remarks. Today, I'm gonna to speak about the federal standards of fair dealing in American commerce and banking. And in particular, Congress's latest addition to those standards, the prohibition on abusive acts or practices, which is the topic of a policy statement issued today by the CFPB. The policy statement explains the prohibition on abusive practices banned after the subprime mortgage meltdown. I wanna share with you more about the meaning of the prohibition on abusive practices First, I'm gonna discuss the history of the standards of fair dealing and of the prohibition, including how it sought to reach conduct that might not otherwise be considered unfair. Then I'll discuss our objectives in proposing the policy statement. And finally, I'll conclude with outlining some key aspects of the prohibition. In the wake of the financial crisis in 2010, Congress passed the CFPB's authorizing statute, the Consumer Financial Protection Act. This banned abusive conduct. However, this prohibition didn't appear out of nowhere. It is rooted in history that goes back over 100 years. And Congress has long tailored federal prohibitions in response to changes what's happening on the ground. It's worth going into some detail here. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, abuses of corporate power, monopolization, and all sorts of other unfair business practices became kitchen table issues for many Americans. False advertising of shady cure-all 
patent medicines was rampant. Americans grew concerned as companies like Standard Oil Trust, U U.S. Steel, and American Tobacco Company became behemoths. They bought their rivals, drove other competitors out of business, and swallowed up whole industries. This era of relatively lax business regulation and increasing consolidation meant that the control of economically and socially significant industries was placed in the hands of few with very few checks. Unsurprisingly, this less competitive and less regulated environment led to harmful price fixing and market allocation schemes, resulting in higher prices for necessities and deceptive marketing for all sorts of goods. It was a particularly low moment for American enterprise as small firms and honest players could not compete. To promote fair competition and protect people from these business excesses, in 1914, Congress stepped in and codified and strengthened common law st standards of fair dealing, which drew upon notions of fairness and a moral economic vision of competition cre by creating the Federal Trade Commission. Congress tasked the new administrative agency with enforcing a broad ban on unfair methods of competition. And this was a pattern that would be repeated. A few decades later, Congress added more to the FTC's authority when the public demanded action from the government as the problem of false advertising worsened. As miracle weight loss drugs and sham tonics purporting to cure baldness and produce various illusory health benefits continued to flood the market. Individual states also took up action to pass new laws and protect people and honest businesses. Congress tackled the problem by passing the Wheeler-Lee Act and codifying a ban on unfair or deceptive acts or practices. Congress made clear that these standards of fair dealing applied not just between businesses, but also between businesses and individuals. Decades later, federal regulators still operating with the old unfairness and deception authorities would face an existential threat to the US and world economy. By immediately selling mortgages on the secondary market, regulators or lenders were profiting on loans that sometimes set people up to fail because they couldn't repay. We know this recent history all too well. When the housing market experienced a downturn, the bubble burst, and the losses in mortgages and mortgage-backed securities reverberated throughout international markets, leading to a major stock market crash and the Great Recession, relegating millions of Americans to a generation of lost economic potential. We saw predatory lending practices at companies like AmeriQuest Mortgage, which was the country's largest originator of subprime loans a New Century based in Irvine. New Century illegally falsified borrowers' income documentation, a practice that became representative of so much in that era. In the aftermath, over 6 million Americans would lose their homes to foreclosure. This brings us back to the post-financial crisis period. As they did before in responses to threats of consolidation and false advertising, Congress once again enacted new prohibitions to meet challenges of the day by adding a prohibition on abusive conduct to the federal standards of fair dealing in financial services. Now, in addition to unfair or deceptive practices, government enforcers would have an additional tool to combat the changes to business practices, including the proliferation of set up to fail products, such as the mortgages that were the basis of the economic meltdown. This was a key part of the public's efforts to fix the failures of our failed financial regulatory regime. But even prior to the financial crisis, government officials had been calling for a more administrable prohibition to address gaps and weaknesses in the regulatory system and to reach conduct that might not otherwise be considered unfair or deceptive. 
while unfairness and deception reach a broad set of problematic practices, misguided enforcement policies and interpretations by FTC commissioners had over time undermined their effectiveness. In 2007, then chair of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, Sheila Baer, explained that where information is minimally disclosed, some courts have held that a practice might not be unfair because consumers can avoid injury simply by choosing another product or service. She also explained for the unfairness cost benefit analysis, lenders often argue that providing credit is a benefit even if questions can be raised about a borrower's ability to repay it. To address some of these concerns, Bayer suggested Congress add the term abusive to address new risks in the marketplace. Now, the term abusive was not really a foreign concept. In fact, it existed already in federal law and regulation, including in the Homeownership and Equity Protection Act, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, and the telemarketing sales rule. It was also in some ways a return to the original framework of consumer protection and fair dealing ingrained in the American tradition. By identifying certain categories of practices that harm the market, Congress's prohibition on abusive practices once again used the law to guide what is permitted based on Congress's understanding of fair dealing and market reality, rather than just theoretical economic models. I draw your attention to this history because it's pivotal to understanding how the prohibition on abusive conduct is rooted in early 20th century attempts to regulate fair dealing. It is also part of a long history of Congress granting new tools to government enforcers to address market failures and new business practices. So what has happened since Congress stepped in to ban abusive conduct? The CFPB has brought a number of enforcement actions against lawbreaking companies here. Applying the prohibition to specific real world facts helps elucidate how enforcers evaluate any wrongdoing. But we wanted to do more than that. Our objectives with the policy statement released today on abusive practices were to summarize the existing precedent, provide an analytical framework that is practical for identifying abusive conduct, and to offer some simple rules of thumb. I think these objectives are critical because while bringing cases and taking companies that ignore the law to court can serve to condemn and deter abusive conduct, its explanatory potential has limits. We wanted to assist our fellow government enforcers and regulators and the market more broadly by drawing out some of the key principles from our decade of enforcement work. I should note that what we're doing here isn't new. There's a rich tradition of federal agencies issuing policy statements to help understand, uh, help advance understanding of complex legal, legal prohibitions. We can look back to the 1980s for some instructive examples. In that decade, the FTC issued a series of policy statements that, had set the, that helped set the tone for the application of its unfairness and deception authority. In 1980, the FTC issued an unfairness policy statement, which included a cost benefit test and de-emphasize focus on whether conduct was proper or immoral. Then in 1983, the FTC set out to similarly clarify its deception authority by setting forth certain presumptions, including that express claims are material, which were later adopted by the courts. Now, whether or not you agree with these policy statements, they were influential. And in certain circumstances, would later get more specifically codified into law. These documents proved to be immensely influential in guidance to courts and the market on how to enforce the bans. In short, they were influential because they were helpful to practitioners, enforcers, and industry. We want today's policy statement to be similarly helpful. 
I hope that this policy statement will not only serve as a practical educational tool by summarizing the existing case law, but also more importantly, to provide a straightforward analytical framework that will help promote a visceral understanding of the prohibition. Providing clearer and simpler guidance is an important goal for the CFPB. The only people who benefit from a lot of complexity is lawyers and lobbyists. This philosophy is one that I've tried to advance across all of our work. We aspire to more clearly communicate the CFPB's expectations in clear, straightforward terms. This helps strengthen the posture of all companies that we oversee, not just those who are the best connected, have the most power or resources. Big and small firms can compete fairly when the rules of the road are clear. It also helps prevent strategic or intentional misunderstanding that some companies use to ignore the law, disadvantaging law-abiding ones in the process. Let me close with some key aspects of the policy statement and explain the public policy concerns motivating them. The law often turns on technical readings of individual words or abstract concepts, but it's important that we not lose sight of the fact that our law reflects our country's values. I'm not gonna spell out everything we said in this statement, but I wanna focus on four particular issues because I think they illustrate the contours of the abusive prohibition. First, one way that Congress made a value judgment is by banning conduct that essentially tricks people. It shouldn't be controversial to say that honest business conduct shouldn't rely on trickery. The policy statement explains how companies are prohibited from manipulating people by materially interfering, or in other words, obscuring important features of a product or service. While trickery and manipulation can often run into the prohibitions on unfairness or deception, an abusive practice will be situated in the context of the transaction. Did a human or digital interface engage in other ways to distract or shift the attention of the consumer to obscure key terms? Deception claims are more concerned with whether company communications create a misleading net impression. The abusive prohibition is in some ways more bright line and focused on company conduct that obstructs people's ability to digest information. Deception tends to be more concerned with words and abusive with actions, although both are relevant to both prohibitions. Companies need to be especially attuned to their use of digital dark patterns. Dark patterns are online design tricks and other psychological tactics used to confuse and manipulate people into making choices they otherwise would not have made. What does it look like? You're probably familiar with many of these. Pre-checked boxes, which default you into an option you didn't want, hiding information behind multiple links or making it difficult to cancel a subscription. This kind of obscuring is not just annoying as the policy statement describes, it can also be illegal depending on the specific facts and circumstances. The prohibitions on unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices were designed by Congress to address wrongful practices as business tactics and technology evolved. Digital dark patterns are new in the sense that they leverage contemporary technology to confuse people, but ultimately they involve the same type of obscuring that Congress has long been concerned about. Manipulating people is wrong, whether on paper or through pixels. Second, coming out of the financial crisis, Congress responded by prohibiting companies from essentially setting people up to fail. When enacting measures to prevent abusive practices, Congress banned companies from leveraging someone's lack of understanding or inability to protect themselves in order to take an unreasonable advantage. In doing so, Congress recognized these gaps that, that gaps in understanding or unequal bargaining power were circumstances that law-breaking companies could profit off of. 
before the financial crisis, mortgage lenders profited by putting people into loans that they couldn't repay. Usually lenders make money when people pay their bills. The incentives are totally aligned. But prior to the financial crisis, lenders using an originate to distribute business model immediately made money by selling loans to the secondary market. This made lenders' balance sheets indifferent to consumer failure, and some lenders exploited that by profiting handsomely off making loans to people who lacked understanding that they wouldn't be able to make their payments or to people who were unable to protect their own interests. Third, more broadly, Congress made the value judgment to prohibit entities from leveraging circumstances where people have no choice but to deal with a specific company. In most markets, this can only happen when a firm has a perfect monopoly. But in many consumer finance markets, it is embedded in the market structure. For example, you may be able to choose your lender, but the lender chooses who services your loan. Sometimes the lender sells your loan to another loan holder or investment vehicle, and then that entity chooses the servicer. The same can be said for debt collectors. You have no control over to whom your lender refers your debt. Even though there may be many participants in these markets, you as the consumer have no choice but to deal with a specific single servicer or debt collector that you did not choose. Consumer reporting companies are similar. You have no choice but to have a consumer report in many cases. And while a lender can choose which credit bureau to pull your report from, you cannot. Congress prohibited companies from leveraging this unequal bargaining power. And that includes consumer reporting companies, servicers, and debt collectors who use the fact that their customers are captive to force people into less advantageous deals, extract excess profits, or reduce costs by providing worse service than they would provide if they were competing in an open market. In 2021, the CFPB charged JPay, a prison financial services conglomerate, with abusive conduct. JPay had an exclusive contract to return funds on a prepaid card to people who were being released from jail or prison. The CFPB alleged a violation of the abusive prohibition because it found that JPay was using the fact that people had no other options to charge fees. In other words, consumers were captive to JPay, and JPay illegally used this gain to gain an unreasonable advantage to extract fees. And fourth, Congress prohibited companies from leveraging consumers' reasonable reliance on them to their advantage. In banning this type of conduct, Congress was likely thinking of the mortgage steering that occurred prior to the financial crisis, when brokers that people trusted would accept side payments to steer borrowers to more expensive loans when they qualified for a better deal. Intermediary relationships like these involving trusted advisors are important for helping people to make difficult financial decisions. In the modern economy, where financial products are highly complex, this is more important than ever. For example, in 2014, the CFPB sued ITT Educational Services for violating the reasonable reliance prong of the ban on abusive practices. ITT was a for-profit college chain that positioned its financial aid advisors as subject matters on how to finance college. In other words, they appeared to be a trusted advisor. In reality, the CFPB's investigation uncovered that ITT's financial aid advisors pushed students into unaffordable loans that simply served ITT's bottom line. Congress was aware of the risks these trusted advisors can pose to people and also ban companies that have generated consumers' trust from taking kickbacks or engaging in self-dealing. Each of these four concepts is spelled out in more detail in the policy statement, which synthesizes the agency's enforcement experience to date. We are now soliciting public input on this new statement. Importantly, 
the CFPB does not have a monopoly when it comes to policing against abusive conduct. State attorneys general and state regulators can bring actions and seek relief for illegal abusive conduct independently or in concert with the CFPB. Congress also empowered the FDIC, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the National Credit Union Administration, and the Federal Reserve Board governors to supervise depository institutions under $10 billion in assets for compliance with this prohibition and to bring enforcement actions where appropriate. The law specifies that the CFPB can also activate Federal Trade Commission enforcement over non-banks and state attorney general enforcement over national banks by undertaking a rulemaking. We welcome input through our new petitions for rulemaking process for potential areas to activate this broader enforcement. Now, there's been a great deal of ink spilled about the failure of federal financial regulators and enforcers to halt the widespread abuses that contributed to a devastating financial crisis 15 years ago. Not only did these regulatory failures harm individual families and neighborhoods, it also hurt every business that engaged in fair and transparent dealing with prospective customers. Congress made a very important judgment that is now in our law about the types of conduct that should not be allowed to fester. And it is incumbent upon the CFPB federal agencies and the states to ensure that our markets reward fair dealing rather than abuse. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was um, wonderful. And uh, I am looking forward to uh, reading closely the statement and hopefully having some students and as well as myself respond to um, the request for comments. Um, we have a few questions that have come in. And again, I remind um, uh, attendants that uh, you can use the Q&A function. Uh, and I'll start with this sort of, um, I don't know, a little hard one, maybe not. Um, but there have been times when the CFPB has been criticized for what has been called, quote, rulemaking by enforcement. Uh, that isn't actually a legal concept. But um, did that critique uh, that debate inform your decision uh, to move forward with today's guidance? No, I think, you know, law enforcement, for example, the Justice Department, many enforcers, um, part of what we have to do is enforce the law as written. But I do think that we've now come a decade with a set of cases. And I think it's now time to take stock of where we are and provide a clearer synthesis, you know, it shouldn't just be high priced law firms that get to look through all of this. We also need law students, we need companies and others to really be able to look at this more carefully. I was really influenced by the history of the FTC, Professor Jimenez, because in many ways, it took a long time for the FTC to get in gear and do its job. Uh, in the early 20th century. So I really don't want to wait decades before this important prohibition becomes very clearly enforced and part of American fair dealing. So in some ways, I want to use this to accelerate what I think is was such a critical response to the financial crisis and really not be able to forget that. Yeah, um, I think that uh, that is part of, as you mentioned, the um, CFPBs and your own commitment to advancing clear and simple guidance, um, I think uh, for the those on the market that are regulated by you, but as well as um, consumers to understand what is um, what is, uh, you know, what is lawful and what isn't. Um, and also we've, sorry to jump in, but we learned a lot, I think in that 1980 to 2010 period. I think on one hand, there was really strong attempts by many at the state level to go after some of the abusive lending practices. In many cases, you know, out of control regulators in Washington just started hitting delete on all these state laws. Mm 
through what's called preemption. But we also learn some of the limits of unfairness and deception to be able to get after certain types of conduct. And I think when Congress reflected on all of that, they made it clear that there is a certain set of, of business practices that really pollute the market. And I think that in terms of fair dealing, um, where we really want everything to be above board, they in some ways wanted to make sure that those practices that we saw in the lead up to the subprime mortgage crisis to, to, to not allow that to be repeated. Um, actually, on that note, uh, do you, do you um, as you mentioned, other financial regulators and state banking um, agencies and states attorneys generals have also, also have authority, share authority with you to investigate for abusive practices. Um, so given your statement, this, the, the uh, policy statement, how do you expect these other government enforcement agencies might use this guidance going forward? Well, one of the things that I think we wanna be clear about, I mentioned uh, sort of out of control preemption. One of the things that the federal government did that Congress did is to try and make sure that there was not kind of one single point of failure. And so what it did was to make sure that even if they created a new enforcement agency, regulatory agency like the CFPB, how could they make sure that even if it was mismanaged or even if it was not doing its job properly, that there were some fail safes? We see how this works, for example, with the Fair De Collection Practices Act, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, others, Truth and Lending Act. But for this one, they set up a pretty interesting system, which was they allowed state attorneys general and other state regulators the ability to bring actions in court. And, and actually, we've had instances where states have done that. And I really am encouraging states to be able to use this tool where they need it. It also does create some limitations. Um, it does not permit, if I'm recalling the law right, state attorneys general to bring actions against national banks uh, chartered by the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency unless there's first a rulemaking. Um, and there's a whole history behind, behind that. It also only allows the Federal Trade Commission to do it under certain circumstances, so like, like a rulemaking. So I think it's actually a really important reminder that in some ways, we've seen this over and over again in our history when regulators drop the ball and the, the effects of it can be so harmful and one of the ways that Congress thinks through that is what's the role of state actions and state law enforcement when it comes to consumer protection is just so critical, but also what's the role of private rights of action, what's the role of other regulators. And I think the whole point of the system is to make sure that we don't have that single point of failure and we reduce those risks. So. There's the, the policy statement I think is gonna help also the law enforcement community really try and um, see where the lay of the land is. And my hope is that it will also be a major resource document for the courts. Now, in the, in the process, you may be familiar, there was a few years ago, an abusive policy statement and it, it was called an enforcement policy statement and in some ways it spelled out what the CFPB would not do. You know, it talked a lot about remedies, that it wouldn't actually seek remedies in certain circumstances. And I think there was um, a sense that that wasn't really providing a rigorous or analytical approach to business practices. And so we looked at all of the work that has been done over the past decade on it and really tried our best to put it um, in one reading. I think we are going to be really eager to get public comment on this. In some ways, we want to make sure that it's reflective 
of what um, the cases that have been done, the actions that have been done, but also to make it as helpful as possible to reflect the reality of what Congress prohibited. Absolutely. And I, I think um, I have um, some uh, assignments for students in my uh, next consumer law class uh, in the fall um, that will come out of this. Um, uh, one other question. So one thing that really stuck out to me in your remarks um, was your mention of how the law often turns on the technical reading of statutes, um, but that we shouldn't forget about how the law reflects our values. Can you say more about the values that underlie this ban on abusive conduct? Yeah, I think one of the things I've tried to do is really make sure that what we're doing is rooted in the American legal tradition and history. And I think all of you as, as students and others are already familiar with concepts like the common law, how it evolves over time, how judges and others evaluate practices in the context of, of those laws. And one of the most interesting things that I think has served our country so well is that rather than wait for Congress to say, you know, it's illegal to um, advertise, you know, baldness cures unless there is X, Y, Z, you know, it doesn't do that. It really sets up a few key standards. And the prohibition on unfair practices and deceptive practices, that has actually not just been part of federal law, it has then been part of so many state laws. So we now have a, a significant body of actions for which people can look at to, and see how it can over time reach new and evolving business practices. In other words, it, it, it's not a constant game of catch up when it comes to the law. And that's true for other types of laws as well. And so I think when it comes to abusive, there was clearly an identification of where um, unfairness or deception wasn't cutting it for, for Congress and where they wanted to cover more. And as I mentioned earlier, I think in some ways, it really focuses on the actions of the company not just sort of the outcomes or the words that they use. And, and I think really when we look at the sophistication of today's digital markets or the context in which people make decisions, there's often various ways to manipulate or to not be um, fully upfront or to otherwise exploit a trusted relationship. And I think that's really where there's a lot to think about how we use and administer that prohibition on abusive. I hope that's responsive. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it actually leads me to another question. Um, I'm, I'm curious about how you hope um, or what, yeah, how do you hope that um, consumer financial protection markets, consumer financial markets will change in response to this? Company well, you know, it's already the law. And so I think part of it is making sure that you know we're, we're trying to provide some transparency on really what's been done to date. And I here's one of my observations of you know having worked in several regulatory law enforcement agencies. You often hear a very very common theme from companies, which is that they get solicited by all sorts of lawyers who say, pay me and I'll tell you all sorts of things you can and can't do. And a lot of companies sometimes just wanna be able to look something up themselves or to get their own counsel on things or get a second opinion or look for public information. I think that's a, also a key part of this is we don't want, we know, that a lot of the lawyers who solicit these companies, they're looking for billable hours. But those who are on boards of directors, officers, in-house lawyers, 
They just want to make sure they're on the right side of the law. And I think the more we've been able, we've been issuing a number of interpretive statements, a number of guidance documents that really lowers the costs for honest companies to know what side of the law they're on. Yeah, you're going to put some of our students out of business. <laughs> well, you know, look, as people who are in the, who are studying to be attorneys, you know, it's just so important to remember that one day you will be an officer of the court, hopefully. And with that comes a real responsibility to yourself engage in fair dealing and, and, and real meaningful service, um, you know, not just to clients, but to our system. And I think part of that involves, you know, helping develop um, our understanding of how current legal prohibitions might affect um, the future and might affect the markets because our economy really is such a reflection of the rules and laws we have combined with the ingenuity and hard work of people. So I think for law students, it's really important to remember that as part of ultimately, you know, wherever you are, how you're serving the public. That very well said. Um, okay, one last question. Um, I, I'm curious, um, given that, as you mentioned, you've been issuing a number of um, policy statements uh, to, to uh, um, you know, on various issues, how does this policy statement fit into the CFPB's overall priorities? You know, I think what uh, it goes back to something I said, I really don't want to look back. Um, you know, I don't want in 20 years people to look back and say, that authority could have stopped the, these, this major market problem. You know, over the last several weeks, we have seen uh, the failure of Silicon Valley Bank um, and, and lo lots of concern about what were the regulators looking at and was the rollbacks in regulation appropriate? And I think sometimes there's laws on the books, um, but just sometimes the regulators want to pretend that it doesn't exist. And the truth is, is we've been working hard at the CFPB to really use a whole set of dormant authorities. We've activated a dormant authority to conduct supervisory oversight over certain risky non-banks. We finalized a rule last week uh, on small business lending that was actually supposed to be done years ago. Um, we are getting ready to propose another rule on consumer control of data that will accelerate the shift to open banking. So I just think it's, it's incumbent upon every agency to look at the tools that Congress has said to use and really take seriously about using it. When I was at the Federal Trade Commission, um, there was a whole host of unused legal authorities from made in USA fraud to energy and so much more. And often commissioners spanning multiple administrations would simply complain rather than act. And I think what you're seeing us is taking a hard look at the legal authorities that we have and starting to really use them. And I think that in some ways, that's an example of how we see ourselves, not just helping individual families, or, uh, but also helping those who are actually running an honest business. I really, really want to commend you for that. Um, but on that note, we are um, out of time and out of questions. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the policy statements, um, which uh, my students and I will pour over. And um, hopefully we will see you in person at some point in Irvine when your schedule permits. Th that is terrific. And again, I hope that 
you know, those who are in the consumer law community can really start thinking about, in some ways, we're really in a new era where a lot of the status quo approaches to consumer protection have, we were moving past them. We're moving to a more rigorous and analytical way of looking at markets, looking at consumer behavior. And the, the digital era, the rise of advanced computational methods or you know, artificial intelligence as it's sometimes marketed, it really behooves us to look at what are the laws today and how will we use them you know, to protect the public. So uh, Professor Jimenez, I'm really grateful um, that you invited me. I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you and your students, but I'll have to take a rain check. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for attending. <laughs>